I'd like to welcome everyone to the Vasculitis Foundation webinar for today. I'm Kathy Olewski, the host for the Vasculitis Foundation educational webinar series, and I'm also a patient living with MPA vasculitis. Today, we're addressing questions about new medications with Dr. Nicole Orzakowski. Dr. Orzakowski did a great presentation at a recent Vasculitis Foundation, Foundation Regional Conference, and this recording is a follow-up to her presentation. So we should begin today with an introduction of Dr. Orzakowski. Dr. Nicole Orzakowski is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill and is the medical director of the UNC Rheumatology Clinic. Dr. Orzakowski's clinical interests are in the evaluation and management of patients with vasculitis, inflammatory arthritis, and scleroderma, and in the use of musculoskeletal ultrasound for diagnosis and response to treatment in rheumatologic conditions. She has mentored medical students, residents, and rheumatology fellows, and is involved in educational committees at the American College of Rheumatology. Well, welcome, Dr. Orzakowski. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I think if it's okay, we are going to get right into some questions. We uh, had some feedback from your great presentation that we saw at the Chapel Hill Conference for the Vasculitis Foundation. And these are some of the questions that came up. So if it's okay with you, I'll just go ahead and dive right in. That sounds great. Let's get started. All right, so the first one is was asked, would Dr. Orzakowski talk more about her endpoint slide concerning the advocate trial? As a patient, I'm feeling excited about the study, but honestly, I don't understand the science to fully understand what the conclusions were. Sure, so um, I'll sort of expand on that a little bit. Um, so. Uh, and talk maybe about the role of, of Acapan in relation to glucocorticoids as well. Um, so our goal for years um, has been to find a medication that works as quickly as glucocorticoids without the side effects, right? Without the toxicity um, and works as effectively. Um, and it's enticing to think that a Vacapan might be that medication um, but I'm not exactly sure that that's going to be the medication uh, just yet that helps us eliminate glucocorticoids altogether. Um, the advocate trial showed um, that patients were able to achieve remission um, and have fewer relapses with less prednisone, and that's really important. Um, but remember the patients in this trial, even in the avacapan arm, um, did receive some prednisone. So uh, they received some in the screening uh, period of the trial, and they received um, a little bit in the first four weeks of the trial as they were tapering off. And they were able to receive some prednisone um, as rescue medication if they had relapses during the trial period. Um, and so if, they, um, if we look back and we look at the uh, total amount of prednisone exposure in the groups, um, in the Avacapan group, the average amount of prednisone that those patients uh, received, um, sort of average amount per patient per day, uh, was about four to five milligrams. So not a whole lot. And compared to the patients who were assigned to the prednisone group, they got about 12 to 13 milligrams per patient per day. So, you know, there really was a difference in terms of prednisone exposure, but it wasn't zero in the Avacapan group. Um, so I think the jury is still out, so to speak, as uh, to whether um, avacapan will allow us to completely eliminate glucocorticoids for the treatment of ankylvasculitis going forward. I think it's very exciting to think about using a lot less corticosteroid going forward um, for helping patients. Um, but I think, you know, sort of longer um, studies are going to be needed to answer that question. Well, that is a great answer. I'm sure you know that all of us patients are like excited to hear that there might be uh, an alternative to the amount of steroids that we we know we have to have. But I mean, how exciting if we could, you know, take less or not take any someday. Absolutely. Um, and so the next question, is it possible that Avacapan could someday replace steroids completely or is the idea to have drugs that reduce the amount of steroids? You sort of answered that, but it was one of the questions. So maybe just reiterate that answer. Absolutely. So I think that um, probably more study is needed to answer that question. 
Um, I think that um, I, I think in the near future, we will likely see less corticosteroid um, if evacopan is being used more often. Um, that seems to be the promise of this medication after the advocate trial. But again, this is one trial. Um, and I think we're going to need more trials too, and sort of more real world experience uh, to feel comfortable with that. That makes sense. And another Avacapan question. I, I, just like everybody was excited about this, but this one is part of the goal with Avacapan to lead to remission more quickly. Yes. So I think that the investigators were um, excited to look at this question. Um, it certainly seemed like um, quicker remission. There was a suggestion of that in the phase two trial, right? So the trial that came before um, the advocate trial. Um, and then the investigators did look at the BVAS, right? The Birmingham Vasculitis Activity Score. This is how we measure activity of vasculitis. Um, they looked at that at four weeks in the Avacapan trial. So that's really early remission. Mm -hmm. um, and it was one of their secondary outcomes, but they didn't publish it in their main paper. It was in sort of their supplementary material. Um, and they didn't comment on it in their publication. So I suspect that it wasn't significant, um, but it is something that there was a suggestion that maybe Avacapan could lead to remission more quickly. When you looked at one of the other um, important or key secondary outcomes, which was the um, albumin um, creatinine ratio, which is you know how um, protein is sort of spilling through the kidney, that did seem to decrease fairly quickly in the evacopan group um, at four weeks. And so it's again, another suggestion that that is working quickly in patients. So we just need more information and more time. Well, that that is um, again, also very promising to all of us. Uh, the next question is in your summary slide, you wrote that the most severe cases of ankyovasculitis were not enrolled in advocate. What are the reasons for this issue and are there plans to include more severe cases? So I was not one of the study investigators, but I think I can speak sort of generally as to um, why those patients were likely not included in the study. Um, you know, uh, one of uh, the most important parts of running a clinical trial is to minimize harm. And so when you're thinking about an investigational drug, you, you are really trying to minimize harm to all patients, but patients with the most severe manifestations of disease, such as bleeding in the lungs, that's called diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, where you would need to be um, put on a ventilator. That's a life-threatening situation. Or somebody who had really severe kidney involvement and potentially need a dialysis, that's obviously another very severe uh, manifestation of ankyovasculitis. Um, we might not want to use an investigational drug in patients whose organs are threatened um, or those patients that need, you know, really um, um, involved medical care, uh, plasma exchange or dialysis, for example. Um, there may be other regulatory issues that um, they, you know, the investigators were not allowed to include those, those patients in the trial. I'm just not sure. I'm not being an, uh, part of the trial myself, but um I would also say that knowing that a patient had severe organ manifestations and they may be randomized to a group that did not include corticoids would not be the current standard of care. And so that would be a large reason why those patients are not included. Well, that all certainly makes sense. Um, the One of the questions that came up was also something that I thought about. Are there because of the things that came out of the advocate trial, it leaves you wondering where it goes from here. So the question was, how many phases of the advocate will there be? So advocate itself is over. That yeah. trial is over and closed and we have the data. Um, and there is now a phase four trial that is um, recruiting. So this is a, an, a large um, ongoing long-term safety trial. So the, um, the primary um, point of that trial is safety. And that's a five-year trial in patients with ankyovasculitis. And that is currently recruiting at multiple sites across the United States. Um, there will be three arms to that trial. And I don't know if you want me to talk about what that looks like, but I think, I think that'd be great. I think uh, it, the safety of a long-term use of a drug is very concerning to all of us also. 
Absolutely. And it's very different, um, you know, if a patient takes a drug for a year and stops versus if a patient takes a drug for five years and stops. Um, I think we get a lot more information from that. So there'll be three arms to this trial. Um, uh, patients in one arm will get um, a vacapan for five years. Patients in the second arm will get a vacapan for one year and then switch to placebo for the next four years. And patients in the third arm will get placebo for all five years. And so we'll be able to see and compare across those three groups what happens to all of those patients. So you can imagine they're um, trying to recruit a lot of patients with ankyovasculitis. Um, I think that's going to be an important trial, um, but we'll have to wait a while to get the results. Wow. A five-year trial. I'm sure lots of trials are that long. It just um, seems so far away. <laughs> exactly. Um, the next question is from an EGPA patient. Um, so it says, I'm a patient with EGPA for six years. I've had two relapses. Could you please explain to a very non-technical person what the Mandara study could mean to me? Are you saying that this drug, Benralizumab, I tried to practice these words, um, <laughs> increases chances of remission for EGPA? So the Mandara study um, was interesting in that it looked at benralizumab, um, which is a, a monoclonal antibody, right? These are most of the drugs that are coming out these days um, for inflammatory autoimmune disorders. Um, so it's a monoclonal antibody and it binds to the interleukin-5 receptor, which is like the door, the doorway into the cell. Um, it binds that receptor on eosinophils. And that drug was compared to a drug that's already approved for EGPA called mepolizumab. Mepolizumab is a different monoclonal antibody that binds to the interleukin-5 chemical. So not the receptor, but the chemical that sort of floats around. Um, when they compare these drugs um, head to head, the um, remission rates were exactly the same. So it's not that one was better than the other. It just proved that benralizumab worked as well as mepolizumab in putting patients with eGPA into remission. Um, unfortunately, um, patients in both groups actually had the same relapse rate. And so patients got into remission and unfortunately about 30% in each group also had relapses. So um, I'm not surprised to hear that statement or that question from the patient with eGPA. We know this is a relapsing disease. Um, and, you know, 30% of patients in this study period relapsed in both groups. So it is nice to know, though, that um, we potentially have another option for the treatment of eGPA. I think it's important that these studies get done um, because it's a rare disease and just having one drug is, you know, not great. It's nice to have another option for patients. It's not approved yet, but these studies are really important um, as a stepping stone for helping to get the drug approved. Right. And we all know how important it is to have, to keep having better drugs each year. I mean, a, as a patient, I personally went through quite a few that didn't work for me and then one that did great. So exactly. that, that is what, it's great to hear that. I actually had a question about the difference between, in, uh, medications being injectable and medications being in the form of infusion. I think all of us would maybe love to get to the day where our medications were in some form other than infusion. So that was my question. Do they have to be studied as infusions for a certain amount of time before they could possibly be injectable or even oral pills? I just, how, what is the process like? Yeah, um, that is a great question. So um, it is an extremely complicated process. So we're talking about monoclonal antibodies, right? Not chemicals. And so they have to be manufactured in a very specific and complicated way. Um, and we're talking about proteins that are getting um, engineered, generated, manufactured. Um, and so they're large. These are large particles that... Um, are, I, I guess I would say to you, easiest, delivered easiest in an IV version. Um, but obviously, there's great demand for sub-Q um, injection for all the reasons we all know, right? It's just easier to get a sub-Q injection. Um, who wants to sit in an infusion center for hours? Um, who wants to really get an IV put in their arm? It's just so much easier if you could inject yourself and keep moving. Um, and so 
you know, there, there is a lot of experience now um, with making these medications, even though they're extremely complicated, um, and a lot of experience with figuring out how to get that large protein and the total amount that you need in a dosing from an IV version converted into a sub-Q version um, that will um, work, that will be um, get, getting that volume down to about one to two mLs because that's really all you can inject into the skin um, and then getting that absorbed into the system. Um, and so that is a very complicated process that it frankly is um, beyond my ability to explain to you. <laughs> but um, there are very smart people who have figured out how to do that. Um, and then it has to get studied. It has to get studied again. So, um, you know, there are some medications, you're absolutely right, that started as IV, then they reformulate into a sub-Q version. It has to get studied to make sure that the level um, is equivalent to what an IV level would be and that it works in patients. Um, and that they don't have a reaction to the sub-Q version because the IV version may be perfectly fine, but then you give it a subcutaneous injection and someone has a reaction to it. Um, so that all has to be proven before it gets approved. That was a great explanation, actually. I, I think the question came up when I was watching your presentation. I, I could be crazy, but I think I was... I heard or read somewhere that rituximab may be available in sub-Q. It's being worked on, I think. Being worked on. So I guess that's what it was, because in my brain, I was like, wow, I had a reaction to rituximab as an infusion. I was really glad I was there with medical help. And so that makes sense. It all has to be studied. It has to be safe to be something that can be done at home. So Dr. Orzakowski, one final question. I was thinking about how much information you gave us that is so positive and really makes me hopeful for the future. But as a patient, I, I'm sure others do too. I wonder about how long these things will take. There's a timeline involved in going from discovery to phase trials to actually releasing it. Do you have some thoughts on that that you can share with us? Yes, um, these things are slow and they do take time. And I think the average time from what we say bench to bedside for, you know, the discovery of the molecule to the initial, um, you know, uh, phase one, phase two, phase three trials to finally being approved um, for uh, patient use is about 15 to 20 years. For, oh, wow. Um, any of these medications. Yeah. So it takes a very long time. Um, and I know that uh, there are people that are working on trying to accelerate that timeline, uh, trying to get things out a lot quicker for patients, but a lot of it is safety. There are safety uh, precautions that we really need to be um, aware of, and we don't want to put something out there that's going to harm patients. So there are necessary uh, safety measures in place that, that need to be followed. Well, thank you. I I think it really helps us to know that it that research is being done and that it our disease, as rare as it is, is considered important enough for the research to be done. And there's funding going towards this research, but there's a timeline too. So um, it's not going to be something we can ask our doctor about next week. Just something we we wait and listen more about. Well, thank you so much for sharing all that. Did you have any final thoughts that you would like to add today? Just wanna to thank you so much for um, for doing this and for the great work of the Vasculitis Foundation. And I, I really appreciate you including me today. Thank you. Oh, we appreciate you. And just for viewers, in case you haven't watched this, I hope you have watched this first, but I hope you have watched uh, Dr. Orzakowski's presentation at the Vasculitis Foundation Regional Conference in Chapel Hill in March of 2024. There is, it is available on the Vasculitis Foundation's uh, YouTube channel. You can also, if you struggle to find that, just go to the Vasculitis Foundation website and it, and there's a place there that you can click on that it says videos and it'll take you to that YouTube channel. Um, and, and before we finish up today, I would like to uh, share a little bit of information also. So uh, we have had a a great relationship. The Vasculitis has, Foundation has had a great relationship with the um, VPPRN. 
and that I would like to talk a little bit about it because I'm excited about it. But um, I am the I would like the patients who have vasculitis to consider joining the va vasculitis patient powered network. Uh, I'm personally a VPPR patient champion. So I help to promote the VPPRN's efforts to get patients to join their registry and to complete their biannual surveys. So I can't tell you everything about the VPPRN, but I would like to encourage you to visit their website at vpprn.org. What I can tell you is it is a global patient registry. Patient data, that means your patient data, drives research in vasculitis and providing researchers with information about you and your experience. That's the key for advancing our knowledge of vasculitis. So if you want to see more of what Dr. Orzakowski told us today, uh, join the VPPRN to help with that. And of course, I'd like to say thank you to Dr. Orzakowski, uh, the Vasculitis Foundation for providing these webinars and to our, to our sponsors, which I just, <laughs> and to our sponsors, Amgen, AstraZeneca, and Novartis.